human activity is at the center of climate change. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is increased by a whooping 48%. Think about your typical day. Most of us take showers when we could just as easily be taking a bucket bath. We use soaps, shampoos, and toothpaste, which contain microplastics. We use transportation, which spews toxic fumes into the air. We consume meats and products, which are produced at the cost of the planet. And our commodity choices, too, are driven by social trends rather than resource considerations. From the time we get up in the morning, brush our teeth, cook our meals, travel to school, college, or work, and back, till the time that we go to bed, each and every activity damages the planet. Every aspect of our day-to-day -day life results in the creation of some waste or in the degradation of natural resources. Parallelly, while many of us flirt with the romanticized idea of sustainability, often seeking climate-conscious, organic, or vegan options, we often fail to do the simple, bare minimum that we can do in our day-to-day -day lives. A large part of the problem, however, lies in our flawed perception of sustainability in climate change. More often than not, people tend to conflate sustainability and environmental conservation, while in reality, sustainability is so much more than that. Simply put, sustainability means fulfilling our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Climate action is only one amongst the 17 sustainable development goals that have been laid down by the United Nations. Similarly, most of the people that I'm privileged to know have heard of climate change. But I often find myself asking them, just like I'm now asking you, Take five seconds and think about what climate change means to you. More often than not, the most frequent responses I get are terms like global warming, melting glaciers, rising sea levels, or even names such as Al Gore and Greta Thunberg. What else though? More often than not, most people's knowledge of climate change is limited to this. And I can't blame them because these are the normative terms and phrases which are most commonly a part of the mainstream discourse around climate change. Therein lies the problem, though. Think about it. We often hear buzzwords like virtual reality and artificial intelligence, but how much does the average Joe really know about it? I believe that climate change and global warming are terms that students study about. They hear of them in schools. But... By virtue of that, they've very literally been reduced to textbook definitions. The challenge that then arises is that when something becomes a buzzword, when something becomes a textbook definition, there's a certain disassociation or distance, if you will, that's created between the word and the user of the words. AI and VR are certainly looked upon as something which have a wow factor. But by virtue of that, they're also considered to be something that only truly specialists can understand in entirety. And similarly, climate change, in my opinion, has become a buzzword. But people have also started to believe that there's not much they can do about it. At a deeper level, however, it's important to realize that one cannot do much about a problem until they understand what the problem really is and how it manifests itself. Call it a drastic comparison, but climate change is much like a bomb scare. Many people have received a red alert. They know that there's something dangerous out there, but what many don't realize is the scale and the intensity of the threat. The biggest challenge that we face is not climate change. It's the fact that there is a fundamental problem with the way in which we perceive climate change. For the purpose of my talk today, I'm going to talk about the issue of air pollution, which while we may not realize it, poses an existential threat to the future of our existence on this planet. Now, indeed, air pollution and climate change are nothing but two sides of the same coin. And let me explain you know, why I say that. Recently, I was conducting a workshop on air pollution with some young fourth grade students. I asked them, um, you know, what causes climate change? And most of them said global warming. Now, this was something I expected them to know, uh, but I decided to follow the same line of questioning. And I asked them what causes global warming? 
And some of them quip, bhaiya, bhaiya, it's the greenhouse effect. And absolutely, I mean, they, they were absolutely right. But the realization that I was attempting to draw them to, which is the same realization that now I'm attempting to draw you towards, is that what ties together global warming and climate change is, is nothing but air pollution. It's emissions, it's greenhouse gases, which are at the center of the problem. It is thus that I've always argued that we do not need to look at air pollution and climate change as two different issues. They're two sides of the same coin. In India, we often blame, you know, we, we wrongly often blame farmers for air pollution because some of them practice stubble burning during the winter months. The reality, however, is that the stubble burning season lasts only for 30 to 45 days, while the air quality remains visibly poor for four to five months, spanning from October to February. You will notice that I said visibly poor. That's right. The air quality remains poor around the year in India. We just don't tend to notice it as often in the summer months because we can actually see and smell the air pollution in the winter months because of the smog. Another popular myth that's, is that, that exists in the country is that the air is only polluted in North India. But this is also not true. Over the past few years, Chennai and Mumbai both as seaside cities, even then have witnessed worse air quality than that that I have seen in Delhi. It's not stubble burning, it's not firecrackers either. What then explains the poor air quality in India? Any guesses? Well, it's our cars, it's our buses, it's our motorbikes, it's our planes and our ships. Because today, there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that the primary cause of air pollution, not just in India, but in many developing countries around the world, is vehicular emissions. You may remember that during the lockdown, the first lockdown back in 2020, there were several viral threads and posts on social media around the, the clear skies, the unprecedentedly clean air. And they were right. Because, in fact, during this first 2020 lockdown, the air quality in Delhi, for example, improved by a staggering 79%. With planes, buses, and bikes out of the equation for just 70 days, a little over two months, the air quality drastically improved. What more proof do we need that anthropogenic activity, human activity, is the central cause of air pollution, and by virtue of that, the central cause of climate change? As I was mentioning earlier, the need of the hour is not for people to know about the problem. It's for them to understand the problem and to know how to act on it. Unfortunately, most people I talk with believe that there's nothing they can do about climate change. They believe that a solution to climate change can only be found when governments and corporates decide to work, to work towards a solution. But that, according to me, is simply nonsense. It's shocking for someone as young as myself who has devoted eight years of my youth's life towards building awareness and finding solutions to the climate crisis that people believe that there's nothing they can do. I would argue that individual action is the most important and it's the most impactful. Let me share a story. Recently, a prominent publication reached out to me to write a piece for them on the immediate solutions to climate change that individuals could take up. I was, of course, most happy to oblige and I sent them the piece. A few days later, the editor reached out to me and asked me um, if I would like to revise it because he thought that the solutions were um, too elementary, he said, and, and uh, they weren't what they expected from a seasoned climate change advocate. Um, let me tell you what these solutions were. In that article, I had suggested that most Indians who could afford a motor vehicle, be it a car or be it a bike, drove down to the neighborhood market. Now contrast this with Europe, where you know uh, people tend to walk or cycle down to the neighborhood market as long as it's just a few blocks away. So similarly, amongst this measure, I'd also suggested measures such as composting, switching to electric vehicles for those who could afford it, and also making simple sustainable switches like moving from a plastic toothbrush to a bamboo toothbrush or moving from a plastic straw to a metal straw. The reason that I'm sharing this story is because 
I'm sure that many of you would agree with me when I say that a lot of these simple measures are not followed by most people. I was forced to tell the editor that I would not change my suggestions because there's no point in my suggesting complex in scientific solutions when the simple basic ones aren't being applied. And that's what's really important, shifting the narrative, overcoming this increasing disassociation from climate change and making people aware of their role in addressing the climate crisis now, as well as in the time to come. While I mention time, while I'm on the subject of time, it's interesting to think of the role that time has had to play with regard to climate change. Because climate change results in the deaths of millions of people every year, and that number only seems to be rising year after year. The answer to that question has to do with time. Human beings concern themselves with what they can comprehend, with what they can imagine. We don't see or feel the consequences of climate change in the way we witness or experience those of a natural disaster. Action on climate change from any stakeholder as a result of that is not decisive. It's not urgent because of the fact that the consequences aren't immediate. Climate change is affecting our lives slowly and steadily without us knowing. And with each day that goes by, we're inching closer and closer to a point of no return. What then is the solution? The solution is simple. The solution is to empower and to support the youth and to amplify their voices. Because the reality, the reality is that the vast majority of policymakers who sit in parliaments around the world today are not likely to remain in parliament 20 years from now. Although we're already feeling the effects of climate change, the really devastating ones will be felt in a few decades from now. My generation has been handed down a planet that's been exploited for its resources mercilessly. It is my generation then and generations after mine who will have to face the impacts of the crimes of generations before us. It's only fair then that we have a say in shaping the policies which will shape our tomorrow. That is exactly why the solution to climate change is intrinsically dependent on the youth. Most young people are unafraid to speak their minds we aren't tied down by political ideologies. We don't have organizational obligations which prevent us from sharing our bold revolutionary ideas. For many countries around the world, climate change isn't yet an election issue, which is to say that it's not elect which is to say that it's not included in their election manifestos. Take India, for example. It wasn't until 2019, just two years ago, that the two largest parties in India included the words climate change in their manifestos. It is young people who are most prominently advocating for issues of climate change, and it is us who are responsible for making climate change an election issue. We need to change our strategy around climate change messaging. Human beings are selfish, and if talking about the damage to the planet has not worked, we need to start talking about the impact on human beings. In 2019, India lost 1.67 million people due to air pollution-related complications. Scientist research has shown that the coronavirus may have emerged because deforestation has weakened the man-animal zoonotic barrier. And if humans don't care about the ill effects of deforestation, maybe they'll care when they know how it's landed them in the pandemic. I'm not advocating for an upheaval of the system. I'm not saying that we should go from zero to 100 like a Ferrari in three seconds. That's not viable, that's not realistic. What I am advocating for, however, is for existing institutions to support and to amplify youth voices, to make climate governance more inclusive, and for everyone to make piecemeal changes. We don't need a hundred environmentalists living a perfectly sustainable lifestyle. We need millions and millions of people living an imperfectly sustainable lifestyle. We need everyone to do their bit for the planet. The narrative around climate change needs to shift from being something that people disassociate themselves from to being something that people actively engage with. Because climate change is real. It's here and it's now. We must act now, if not to save the planet, then to save ourselves and to save generations after ours. Thank you so much. Namaste.